Hi, this is Paul. As you probably already know, the Exodus seminar has landed on Open YouTube, and I couldn't be more happy. Uh, there are, I have watched all 16 episodes. A uh, number of them I have watched multiple times. I watch them on Daily Wire Plus. I think they're a really valuable piece of work, and they very much deserve to be out there on Open YouTube. In anticipation of a more public lecture that Jordan was planning on doing to the Bible, sort of a getting back to what he did with the Genesis seminar, sort of a monologue. He had this seminar, obviously, with a group of men that he very much respected. There's a ton of material in this because, of course, there are 16 episodes. Each are two hour plus long, and they're full of, they're full of, they're full of wisdom. So I, before we dig into it too much, and again, I've I'm a little frustrated by the timing of all this, but beggars can't be choosers, so we will, we will deal with what we have. I want to talk about wisdom and how to think about this, because we're dealing with the Bible, and even if you're the kind of person that says, well, the Bible is the Word of God, okay, uh, what do you do with it? It's the Word of God with respect to what? Now, in Genesis... You get the you get the creation story. You get Adam and Eve. You get uh, you get the 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 antediluvian patriarchs and these people that lived long lives. And then you get the children of Abraham. You get Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Judah, and that whole story. Which of course the book of Genesis ends with the family in Egypt and they're being fruitful and multiplying. You open the Bible and you read the story of the descendants of Abraham and they are in Egypt and there's a new pharaoh in Egypt and they are now enslaved. Okay, what does that have to do with you? Why would you read such a thing? Now, now Jordan talked about this quite a bit when he did the Genesis series and, and faced the fact that on one level it's exceedingly strange to be having a conversation about this book. On another level... Uh, this book has been the foundation of um, names, we could say Latin civilization. You know, we often say Western civilization, but um, in, in many ways it's, it's Latin civilization. I'm trying to think of, I believe it was, uh, I think it was Tom Holland actually who was, maybe I can find that clip. People would say, well, you can gather wisdom from anywhere. And, well, that's true. If you're keeping your eyes open, you can gather wisdom. You might ask, well, what, what exactly is wisdom? And you might say, well, wisdom, wisdom is, or, is, is the thing that you need in order to have your best life. But then you'd have to ask the question, well, what is good? And, in fact, we, if you look at someone like Rene Girard, we don't decide what is good just sort of out of thin air, in fact, we borrow our desires from each other. And so whole civilizations, one way to, I was having this discussion about terrible communities. Peter Lindbergh uh, sent me a couple of the pieces that he had written lately, and he was thinking of me. And, and it, that's the problem with these videos. It's just, I, I just keep stringing everything together and, and, and we'll never actually get to the Exodus seminar. I could have started this a year ago and I would have been ready to start now that Jordan releases it. Peter, Peter wrote this piece, all communities are terrible communities. I didn't even know he had a substack. Who doesn't have a substack these days? All communities are terrible communities. Less foolish is not a community. It's a substack. The Stoa is not a community. It's a Zoom account with recorded sessions posted on YouTube channel. There's a sense of community surrounding them. There's a community of practice around the ongoing practices associated with them, such as collective journaling. However, I do not use community to, to describe these. I only use the word community with those I commune with. Uh, the term community is lazily used, overused, and abused. Anytime people interact regularly online, a community magically appear, seems to appear. You have a regular Zoom event, poof, it's a community. You have a Discord or a Slack group, poof, it's a community. If you enable comments on, on Substack, poof, it's a community. And, and we get the sense of that, and that's sort of the word we grab onto, but there's another way in which well, it's, it's, is it a is it a community? A community is not a category. And of course, we're dealing all with this all the time when we talk about 
um, uh, a an ethnic community or a com you know the LGBTQ plus community, the community of of non heterosexuals or non determined heterosexuals. I mean, you could just uh, you could just go crazy with this. There's a there's a sense in which well well all real communities. What do I mean by real communities? And he takes a piece of thesis on theses on terrible communities from an ultra left uh, French collective. The family, the school, work, prison. They are all classical faces of this contemporary form of hell. But they're at least interesting because they belong to a bygone description of commodity evolution, and they are present merely, um, and they are at present merely surviving on. There are terrible communities, however, that fight against the existing state of things, and there are simultaneously quite attractive and better than this world. What, what is he getting at? He's getting at, well, what is it that sort of makes the West the West? Um, it's a long tradition of not only pursuing the good, but a degree of agreement about what is the good. And in many ways, almost all of our conversations are conversations about the good and that which pursues the good. And, and that is in some ways, um, in some ways, wisdom. Now, it's very difficult to argue with that. Well, the, the def well who shall I start with, uh, Sam Harris or Tom Holland? Let's start with Tom Holland um, and this terrific conversation. Uh, Tom Holland, why I changed my mind about Christianity most of the way he threw here at hour and three minutes is picking up where he's saying you know that there are these two dimensions there's the dimension of the cyclum the earthly earthly flux everything being born and dying and then there's the dimension of religio which joins us to the dimension of eternity and over the course of the middle ages in latin europe although not in 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 the orthodox world this becomes fundamental to the way that christians in in medieval europe understand the world and the reformation really just kind of refines it because certainly what happens in Protestant countries, and I'll use England as an example because it's the, the country I know best, obviously, um, religion by the 17th century has come to have a kind of double meaning. On the one hand, it's something that exists separate from the secular. So you can say, well, what religion, say, is England? It's Protestant. What religion is Spain? It's Catholic. Um, but at the same time, religion for, for, for Protestants comes to mean, well, what do you believe? What is your religion? You know, what, what is your personal relationship with God? It's something that is, that is both, so, so in English, certainly, I don't know whether it's the same in Romanian, but in English, religion has this double meaning that it's both personal and kind of to do with, with, with the broader kind of cultural context. But above all, it's something separate from the secular. And what, hap what, what has happened over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries is that whether in, in North America or in India or wherever, Protestants went out and they, they, they dominated vast swathes of the world. So when the British go to India, which people had always called Hindustan, the land of the Hindus, by which they meant Indians, and people would say, well, what is the religion of the Indians, of the Hindus? And they'll want to know, well, okay, well, what, what, what is the religion? Well, and, and of course, for, especially from a Protestant perspective, you ask, well, what are your holy books? Because obviously from a Protestant perspective, the religion grows out of the holy books. And of course, this is something that the new atheists were sort of poking at. No, those books aren't holy. No, those books aren't special. No, those books aren't separate. Those books are just like all the other books and they, they ought not to be prioritized or given special treatment. Oh, okay. We, we participate in this, we call it a culture. We participate in this group of shared values. And these, these values are inherited. They're, they've, in fact, been inherited for so long that, well, one might ask, well, where do they come from? Well, of course, in Latindom, they come from the Bible. And it was a mad question because people in India had no understanding of what, what a religion was. This was an entirely kind of Christian and specifically Protestant concept. People in India had wisdom. This is how to organize your life. These are the good things. These are the bad things. If you do these things, 
good things will happen if you do these other things. Bad things will happen. Uh, maybe you there's uh, there are loopholes and ways that you can sort of skirt the gods. But the reason you go to the temple, and the reason we maintain the temples, and the reason we do all of these things that involve um, that involve sacrifices or prayers or all of those things that eventually get tagged religious. The reason we do this is so that. There will be flourishing, and again, in, in a very low-resolution way, flourishing is, uh, it's better to have food on the table than no food on the table. It's better to have money in the bank than no money in the bank. It's better to have, um, it's better to have a happy marriage than a marriage which is quarrelsome, and so on and so on and so forth. And at a, at a certain facile level, at a certain shallow level, you can say all of that is good, except then you discover that, well, some people seem to have so much money it makes them evil. And some people have so much food, it makes them sick. And some people have a marriage that is so good that they quickly die at the end of it, or um, it comes crashing down around them. And the, as you look at the complexity of life, you begin to look at it and say, wow, there's all, oh, uh, wisdom is not quite so simple. And in fact, well, how do you, how do you articulate wisdom? You might look at, say, wisdom literature, let's say the book of Proverbs, where you have all these lists of things that you should do. And if you're smart, you'll do these things. And of course, uh, a careful reader will look at them and say, hey, wait a minute, sometimes these, these, these Proverbs are contradictory. You know, answer a fool according to his folly, or don't bother answering a fool because the fool won't listen to you anyway. How can they both be wisdom? Well, wisdom is knowing when to answer the fool and when to keep silent. Well, how do you know? Well, and then usually you tell a story. But the British say, well, uh, you know, there are Hindus and, and their religion, and they have a religion, and they kind of tried to work it out. And they said, well, you know, religion has to have holy books, and it has to have kind of holy buildings, and it has to have kind of certain rituals. And so they, they abstracted all. Now, this won't mean a lot to a lot of people. Just going to point out to Kel Zeldin, Tom Holland is wearing denim. All this kind of stuff from the complexity of, of, of India. And they said, this must be the Hindu religion. This must be Hinduism. Um, and there was no word in any Indian language that equated to Hinduism. It was an entire invention of the Protestant British. Um, as was the idea of there being something called the secular. But because... But yet, the Hindus had all of the ways in which they lived. And so, for example, in some cases, um, you go bathing in the Ganges. And others would look at that river and say, everybody bathing in that river, it's disgusting. Others would say, well, you know, the proper way to live is that when a prominent man dies, you, you, um, you know, his wife is consumed on the same funeral pyre that he is. And Christians said, that's ghastly, till death do us part. I mean... That means, reading the book of Romans, you go back through my Romans class, that the, the woman is free from the obligations of marriage when her man dies. She inherits all of his wealth, but she is free from the obligations of marriage. So, so, so what is wisdom? Is it wise to, to burn the widow with the death of her husband, or is it wise that the woman is free to go on and at least uh, derive some benefit from the wealth that he had attained? Over the course of the British Raj, um, the Indian elites came to speak English and came to be educated in, uh, in, in English um, understanding of the world. By the time the British leave India and India becomes independent, the idea that there is something called the secular and there is something called religion is so taken for granted by the Indian elites that they define India as a secular republic. Now, why would that be? Why on earth would this entire worldview that was the Hindu worldview in which um, to, to someone from a Western perspective, you say we can, you know, as, as sort of Paul says to the Athenians in the book of Acts, I can see you're very religious. This land is full of temples and altars and shrines and, and little figurines and idols and gods. And you have, a, you have an enormous pantheon with hundreds of thousands of gods basically covering the whole world. That's your religion. What really works in the world is science, technology. We are here to dominate you and to control you, and we will educate in your ways because it's really of no good use to go to the temple and, and offer a sacrifice to these gods. What you really need to do is go to school and learn engineering and chemistry and physics and biology, and then instead of doing 
hand motions and saying words over an altar. You can go to a laboratory and you can move things around and you can talk to your colleagues and you can read books. And in this way, you will have mastery over the world. And, well, many Indians were very impressed at the mastery that these Protestant British seemed to have over the world. And so... Yeah, but they kept going to the gods, too, because, you know, on one hand, you can do all of this in the laboratory, but who really gets the promotion and why? Is that just chance? Is there such a thing as chance? Is the world divided between the, the heavenlies and Earth, and are they connected? Um, and the idea that um, the duty of the secular republic is to preserve a kind of equal... Um, respect for all the various religions, so Hinduism and Islam and Christianity and Jainism and Buddhism and Sikhism. You, you know, this is, this is part of the founding assumption of India. But and, and then, of course, well, once, once you see religions, well, now we see multiple religions because there's Muslims and there's Hindus and there's, and there's Sikhs and, you know, there, there's all of these different religions. And do they are they all just the same? Are all of those religions do they do they mean nothing? Is that all gobbledygook? Now, of course, Sam Harris would never say that because, of course, New Atheism sort of got its rise after 9/11, and they said, "See, the the religions are making people do evil things." Well, wait, wait a minute. You don't really learn what is good or evil in this laboratory. You just learn about what you can and can't do. Good and evil is a is a different category, and it's even though you sort of discarded that which you tagged as religious, you didn't discard good and evil. In fact, you went on TV and you and you railed against religion because it was evil, because it made people uh, do things that were wrong against other people and made them feel bad and made them anxious about heaven and hell and made them them group up and 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 drive airplanes into buildings. That's that's what religion does. But I think that what we've seen in India recently with the rise of Narendra Modi and this idea of Hindutva, which is basically the idea that it, India is not a secular country that it, 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 its history means that it's utterly saturated with Hindu ideas and principles. And you can't... But wait, wait a minute. I thought, if, I, thought if science was, I thought if science was so great, why on earth would they go back to the temples and say, we, these stories about Vishnu and, and, or, and Krishna, Vishnu and Krishna and Ganesh and, and all of these stories... These are what we are about, certainly not the Muslims over in Pakistan and Bangladesh. You can't just kind of take bits out of this and say, well, this is a religion. The whole of India is Hindu. This is basically what, what Modi thinks. And that means, of course, then that there's no real place for, for, for Muslims or Christians. And so India is becoming a much less tolerant place for, for Muslims and Christians. But it's also becoming a lot less Western. Uh, and actually, what's happening in India at the moment is, I, it seems to me, a kind of final repudiation of that Protestant inheritance that the British had left. And I think you see a very similar process in Turkey, where, um, what was it, a couple of years ago, President Erdogan turned Hagia Sophia, the great Byzantine cathedral, back into a mosque. Uh, and, of course, originally it had become a mosque. Well, well, then wouldn't they just, you know, turn off the electricity and stop using cars and stop, you know, flying in airplanes and stop using medicine? Wouldn't they turn their backs on all of those things? Doesn't, they don't seem to be doing that. With the conquest of Constantinople by the Ottomans. But um, the reason that Hagia Sophia was not a mosque, that it was a museum, was that with Ataturk, you had someone who came in and who was consciously trying to set up a secular state, not on the British model, but on the French model. Uh, the, the French model of laïcité, the idea that um, religion is something utterly separate from the state, is something that Ataturk buys into. Uh, and that's why Hagia Sophia, which had been a mosque, becomes a museum. It's a neutral space. It's the kind of perfect symbol of what Ataturk was trying to do. But I think that, 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 that Erdogan, who is um, much more of a committed Muslim than Ataturk ever was, again, rather like Modi, he's recognizing that the idea of the secular is not something that is neutral.
It's, it's very Western, and I would argue unthinkable without Christianity. So Erdogan is based... Sam Harris is unthinkable without Christianity. Don't tell him. ...like Modi, trying to purge his country of the inheritance of you know, the age when Christian powers were dominant. And I think that the more that Western power retreats, so the more it will become evident to, well, certainly to the rest of the world, but also to, to, to the West, that assumptions and attitudes and things they had taken for granted as simply being reflective of the way the world is, that this isn't actually the case at all. That now, pay attention to that. It's, it's just obvious the way the world is. Well, if that's the case, why would we have to share wisdom with one another? It's just obvious. It doesn't seem to be obvious. If it were obvious, then wouldn't we always all do the right thing? Why, why on earth do we do the wrong thing? Actually, these are very, very specific expressions of everything that makes the West the product of Christian history. It's fantastic how... Um the, the, this ripple effect that one verse can have throughout the history. It's, it's, it's just one it's verse. It's absolutely it's, astonishing. Yeah. And I, I think of, um, say, Paul's letters, which when I was a child and I'd be sitting in that church that I showed you and we'd have the reading from one of Paul's letters, I never understood a word of it. I mean, it just, it meant nothing to me. And now I think these texts, these letters are the most revolutionary letters ever written. They are like depth charges that were placed under the fabric of the Roman world and triggered. And to begin with, people in the Roman world couldn't feel them. And then there'd be a little ripple. And then there'd be another kind of ripple. And then the buildings would start to shake. And then by the end of the process, everything had been utterly altered. And we're still feeling those ripple effects now. You know, the, the, the seismic effect is shaking out and still shaking the world to this day. They are, they are astonishing, astonishing letters. And yet those letters are just one part of this huge collection of texts that we call the Bible. And almost every book contains something that has convulsed the world. Yeah. How? when people aren't reading them, the assumptions that they have. Now we grow up and we, we implicitly make a, a first draft and we receive it from our parents and we receive it from our peers and we receive it from the movies and we receive it from just the way that everyone is living. We talked about the fact that you look at Rene Girard and, and we, we borrow our desires from each other. Well, you're, everyone around is transmitting the desires of the Bible that is deep beneath the civilization. And they might have absolutely no idea that, you know, Sam Harris in his devotion to monogamy and his devotion to his wife and his daughters, oh, it's, it's certainly not true that Christians were the first of it. But because of Christianity, suddenly all of these values that Sam Harris would readily spout about um, equality between men and women and the, the realization that Sam Harris should be a good father and be uniquely devoted to his wife. If Sam Harris were a high-status Roman, well, he would certainly produce heirs with his wife and he might love her dearly, but he would have slave girls, maybe some slave boys, to satisfy his sexual needs. And he would think absolutely nothing of it. And this is, this is Tom Holland's point that he makes again and again and again that when Paul writes in Ephesians 5, and Sam Harris might look at Ephesians 5 and say, oh, that sounds so terrible. Wives, um, obey your husbands as to the Lord. You know, and then he says to men, give yourselves, you know, sacrifice yourselves for your wives. Sam Harris readily does that, but he would never point to the Apostle Paul. These, these ideas have just simply become assumptions about the world. And because they're assumptions of the world, and we don't go all the way back and read them in the Bible, just like when you're walking down the street, you're embedded in a community of laws. Even if you've never, ever, ever read a single 
a, a single law book where all of these laws are that the police and the judges and the courts and the prisons all enforce, you might completely forget and just think, yeah, we drive on this side of the road. Yeah, we don't jaywalk. No, we don't uh, walk into the supermarket and just fill our pockets with the food that we need. We have to stop. And and then we do a really weird thing. We, we bring these things out of our pockets and we and we, we tap them on a little thing, and then we can walk out of the store. If an ancient were to come in and watch all of this, he would say, well, this is just sort of like a temple. I don't, I don't know what this, what this holy thing is in your pocket, but it certainly is important to you, and you go into this place, and you, you, you put it against this other thing, and you walk out. If I go into this place and I take this food and I walk out, some big man stops me at the door and turns me around and suddenly the life is a confusion and I'm now locked up with a bunch of other people that I really don't want to spend much time with. All of us know this and act this way and we've never once read the law books in which the laws of the land are written. We've just learned them from each other. And last summer when I went to uh, England and the Netherlands and Germany, I, I learned their practices. I learned that, wow, in the Netherlands you can take that funny little black box and put it against things. And to, to go into the subways in London, I could just take my that, that funny little black rectangle I have in my pocket and I put it on this little thing and I go through and I ride on a train and then I put it on when I leave and boop, there I go. If I would fail to do that one thing, well, the little gates wouldn't open and I would be stopped at some point. But I've never once read the text of the laws of London. Now, now Sam wants to give us wisdom. And from this conversation with Chris Williamson, um, before there was Jordan Peterson, there was Sam Harris. And everyone was very impressed with Sam. And Sam would say things like, well, the good is obvious, just like having having food in the house and having is better than having no food in the house. And having a, a pretty wife is better than not having a pretty wife. But you might say, well, if a, if one pretty wife is good, how about two pretty wives? How about, well, maybe not even wives. How about just being able to have sex with um, any pretty person? You would like to. What's what's well that's not wise. No, it isn't. Because your wife will take your money. Well, I've never read a book that says my wife will take my money. No, but we watch each other and that's that's the law. Well, what is this law? Where does it come from? But like Andrew Tate's a perfect example of somebody who, again, he's not um, he's radioactive for obvious reasons. I haven't met him. I haven't done it. Why is Andrew Tate radioactive? Andrew Tate, I would imagine, has had, in the last 10 years, Andrew Tate has had sex with way, way, way more women than Sam Harris. Evolutionarily, don't we prize novelty in our mates? Well, Andrew Tate certainly must have better wisdom than Sam Harris because he's certainly had sex with many more women, probably younger and maybe even more beautiful than Sam's wife. Especially deep dive on what he's guilty of or, you know, I mean, he's obviously he's he's got issues, but um... it, it's just it's just and. You know, with Sam, it's, it's everything is just obvious. Everything is just obvious. Oh, okay. I just feel like we're we're at a moment now where. And, and and what are these moments really? Where do they come from? How do we know what they are? How do how do we all together sort of recognize the moment? You go back to my Andrew was it Andrew Snyder with the atmosphere. Well, Netflix. Everyone in the room deciding on what th things on Netflix sort of understood the atmosphere. What do you mean by atmosphere? The air that we breathe? What are you talking about? There, there is such a, a thirst for wisdom. That well, Why are both of these men wearing tight-fitting black T-shirts? Maybe there was once a man named Steve Jobs who had all sorts of wealth and power and always wore black. And maybe that's why. They wear black and and look at these men. You you would think that there are masons or 
um, or grave diggers by the by the dimension of their arms. Oh no, they go into special rooms and there are giant black things that they lift. Well, well, do, by lifting these black things, are is food produced? No. Is water moved? No. What what do they? Why are they lifting these black things? I heard story once of a horrible prison camp where they had these people move sacks of sawdust from one side of the place to the other. Well, the special room that they go to 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 get their arms looking like that, it would seem pretty much just like that Nazi camp because all they're doing is taking these these weights and lifting them up and down just so their arms can can look plump that you know it's just, it can come from so many different places and and those places can be more and and, and 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 do they have plump arms in order to attract more mates but but sam i suppose is still only having sex with one woman and he says andrew tate isn't wise less contaminated with concepts that are more or less toxic, more or less divisive, more or less confusing and toxic, divisive, confusing. Yeah, I mean, I've what, you know, I've watched enough of his stuff to see why young men are getting addicted to his content and thinking that he's there. Whose stuff? Jordan Peterson's stuff. Those he talks about the Bible, that book that Tom Holland said has these depth charges deep under the earth that cause eruptions now and then, sort of like tectonic plates. Their, their life guru. Uh, and I've also watched enough to think that it's not, um, it's not ideal that he's the voice of a generation, right? Oh. Like, we need a... a oh, maybe he's talking about Andrew Tate. Um, a more compassionate, less self-infatuated. Uh, I think it's Andrew Tate. Standard for manliness and and success. Then if, then what? Does he go into that funny room and lift those objects up and down, just like the Nazi prison guards made their prisoners do? He's he's putting out. If I was to, I've got Jordan uh, coming on the show again mm -hmm. at some point later this year, and. It's something that I think I'll speak to him about that he's onto big things with this arc, which is kind of his competitor, I think, to the WEF that he's doing later this yeah, year. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't followed that. Yeah, no. Um, but I do. Th Hierarchies bind and blind. Bill Maher doesn't have time to follow Jordan Peterson, neither does Sam Harris. I think that Jordan's relative abandonment of the conversation directly to young men uh, mm -hmm. to move on to other things, whether it be climate change or the trans issue or pick your poison about whatever he's got interested in recently. Uh, I think that that has left a vacuum and you can't mm. expect young, you can't expect anybody to go through life without insights coming from somewhere. Hmm. Let's play that again. And aim directly to young men onto big things with this arc, which is kind of his. So Jordan's paying attention to the arc and instead of sort of what he was doing first, competitor i think to the wef that he's doing later this year yeah, i haven't i haven't followed that yeah no. um but i do think that jordan's relative abandonment of the conversation directly to young men uh, mm -hmm. to move on to other things whether it be so in other words he stopped telling young men to clean up their room that's fair and in fact i think in some ways you can see this transition in the genesis series now to the exodus series and his his focus on the Exodus series, and his focus on Ark, and his focus on a lot of these other these a lot of these other issues, you can sense sort of a movement instead of sort of being a um, let's say running a Tony Robbins circuit for young men, continuing to tell young men to go into rooms and lift heavy objects so that their 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 arms can look swollen, and if they put on a black T-shirt, it will really look good that, well, he's paying attention to other things. But yet, he still has taken a tremendous amount of time. And I would say, the most successful things that Jordan has done are his biblical series. He said, I, I played before he said to Bill Maher, others have told me too, the biggest hit on Daily Wire Plus is 
Walsh is what is a woman, which is very clever. After that, millions of people are sitting and waiting and listen to Jordan Peterson talk about the Bible. Why? Because Jordan Peterson and Tom Holland both have the idea that all of this stuff, this undeniable goodness that even Sam Harris would say, well, this is, this is, you know, what the West has is, is really good. And he might say, well, we didn't get that from the Bible. We got that from reason. Oh, because uh, everyone else in the world didn't have reason? Well, they didn't have science. Oh, but why did science develop in the West? And, and, and why did all of this, of course, Tom Holland would say, well, this is, this is this transformation of the Roman Empire, of the Latin world that, that moves through Protestantism and then the age of discovery and, the, and all of this. And, of course, I would have to, in some ways, own Sam Harris as sort of a, a Protestant who, um, who, who Protestantized himself all the way out of the faith. But Jordan has sort of abandoned young men, and he's paying attention to other things. He climate change or the trans issue or pick your poison about whatever he's got interested in recently, uh, I think that that has left a vacuum and you can't mm. expect young, you can't expect anybody to go through life without. So in other words, people are paying attention to Andrew Tate uh, more because Jordan Peterson has sort of left them. Um, Together again, Jordan. Uh, the bit of a departure from the usual in the publishing house. Maybe just wanted to get into your creative process of what you were thinking when you wrote 12 Rules for Crushing Pussy. Well, I've spent some time on the internet and it opened my bloody eyes to what these 304s are up to. Yeah, you mentioned 304s. Hoes. Huh. They're sixes. It's like they think they deserve a millionaire. Yeah, I don't know if I follow. They need to learn the harsh reality that I shouldn't be obligated to call them in the morning. And it's not because my phone's broken. It works just fine. Yeah, I feel like we just had a pretty good thing going Going on here with the postmodernism, trans stuff, telling the truth. Well, why don't you ask a girl her body count and see who's actually telling the truth? Mm -hmm. Quite the opposite of it. Women crave leadership and dominance from a high value man. <laughs> but of course, he goes far enough and then. 2016 gold. They want their takes back. They don't even protest me at my shows anymore. <gasps> Oh look, there I go, crying again. The commentators are gonna have a field day with this one. They think crying is for women and children now. Oh, maybe I should just go full Muslim. They can't attack that. I think I speak on behalf of this publishing house when I say that we're totally fine with you just being vaguely Christian. You think so? I know so. You know I almost shaved my head. <laughs> you know how much I paid for <laughs> Insights coming from somewhere. And whether that insight is for young men or young women or old men or old women, whether it's Andrew Tate or, mm. you know, Whoopi Goldberg or whoever happens to have the hot take of the week and, and trend sufficiently highly on Twitter. Uh, people are going to look for someone. They're going to look for answers. And in a world where we are chronically mismatched, our evolved psychology and the world that we find ourselves in has never... Our evolved psychology. It's like... Someone should call Brett Weinstein and talk about the, you of course got the biological track, but humanity has this other track, this mimetic track, this, this upper register, this, this all of this thinky talky stuff, all of this philosophy, all of these ideas, and people, people are going to need wisdom. And, well, is, isn't wisdom just putting your seed everywhere? Andrew Tate, he, doesn't he have wisdom? Never really been further apart. People right. are going to find answers, and and sometimes fluency is a really brilliant proxy for truthfulness or insight. Mm. And if you can say things with a sufficiently uh, well-rounded, compelling delivery, uh, regardless of who you are, yeah. whether it be Whoopi Goldberg or, or anybody else, uh, people will say that sounds that sounds true. It sounds fluent. I'm not sure if it's true. Yeah, except the thing that surprises me is that it should be more obvious than it is to more people that someone's an asshole, right? Again, again, again. Well, you know, if the world is so obvious, why do we need you to tell us? It's like that. Like, it doesn't matter how fluent you are. You're, you're only just declaring your assholery in, in more concise form, right? 
Um, and because it's so obvious that women shouldn't be used. Obvious, I say, evolutionarily. Really? So it, it's kind of a Trumpian moment. Like Trump is obviously an asshole. He's obviously a, a selfish person, but nobody, none of his fans care, right? He's like, he's not a compassionate person. He's, he, he can't even pretend to care about people really, right? He's, but his, his shame- Donald Trump really has Sam Harris's number. Shamelessness around his selfishness has become a kind of superpower for a certain audience because he's, he's conveying the message I will never, ju I will never judge you because I'm incapable of judging myself, right? Like I'm not, I, I'm not holding myself to any kind of standard apart from the gratification of my own desires. So, you know, I'm, I'm in, in some. What, what is wrong with the gratification of my own desires? Since I have a real integrity, because I know I'm selfish. All those people who are pretending not to be selfish, who are pretending to be ethical and compassionate, to care about you know, the sub-Saharan Africa and, uh, you know, education in developing countries. I mean, someone like Bill Gates, right? No, Bill Gates is... And, and we should be we should be caring about sub-Saharan Africa and, and, and we, sh we should be caring about all of these things. The, the, the Romans and the Greeks didn't care about such stuff. In fact, the Romans got, in fact, a little bit annoyed when Christians started helping the poor and, not, and helping the poor of the pagans, too somebody who can't get laid and he's just going to microchip you with the next vaccine, right? Like that, that's, this is going to be a great uh, quote to export from this podcast. Um, uh, you're welcome, Twitter. Um, that's, so that's the, that's the center of narrative and ethical gravity for these guys, right? I don't, I don't include Jordan there, but like Andrew Tate, Trump, there's like a, I've got a fucking Bugatti and you know, you want one and I've got no apologies, right? I've it seems absolutely organic to love a fast car. Got no fucks to give. Uh, I know you want to be like me, you know, and if you don't, if you're not good enough to be like me, I'll sleep with your girlfriend, right? Like that's, that's the, that's not an ethically wise person on any fucking level, even if he can tell me of this ethic. What 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 is this ethic? Where does it come from? Why must we all agree to it? So even if he can string together, if I if I doesn't doesn't being Donald Trump and Andrew Tate seem to work well for them, hasn't it given them power and wealth and attention and and fame and and fans? Hasn't it? It's, it's why should they why should they not be who they are there are a few sentences that seem actionable and useful to get you to clean your room and get in shape and and meet a girl right um we should why, why, why should you clean your room and get in shape and 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 move those heavy objects for no discernible material reason beyond getting your arms swole would be asking more of our elders than that, right? And and so and, and so where I part ways with Jordan, again, I, I do not put Jordan um, in the same category. But he is he has a very different view of the 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 kind of the status of objective empirical truth in relation to the stories we tell about. Uh, ourselves and our place in the world. This objective imperial truth, em, empirical truth with respect to the ethics of Andrew Tate and Donald Trump versus the ethics of Sam Harris. Is that from reason? And um, what makes life worth living? What, what, allow, what will allow for a society to really cohere around shared values? Ah, what makes life worth living? What will allow society to cohere around shared values? So if in Genesis, Jordan sort of inspired young men to lift heavy objects and be monogamous and take responsibility and be the kind of, of man who can stand up at the wedding of a parent and hold the family together, where does Jordan believe this wisdom comes from? Not just to the level of the individual, but to the level of society to decide what is good and what is right and 
and where on earth do these things come from? Excellent. So one of the things that's really fascinated me about Exodus, apart from the, the fundamental structure of the narrative, which is escape from tyranny, sojourn through the desert, and then reemergence hypothetically into the promised land. It's a very classic narrative structure, descent and reascent, is the fact that, uh, the, the, is the manner in which God is represented as the primary spirit in the text. And so I've been toying. Uh, the primary spirit in the text. Well, what, what, what is that? Well, when you have a conversation, you get a sense of the spirit of the person you're talking to. What do we mean by that word spirit? Well, we mean that it's, it's sort of the thing behind their ideas. There's a spirit of Sam Harris, and there's a spirit of Chris Williamson, and there's a spirit of Tom Holland, and there's a spirit of, of Andrew Tate. And, and when, when he says Andrew Tate and, and Donathan, and Donathan, <laughs> Donald Trump are sort of partaking of the same spirit, Jordan is saying now, there's a spirit behind all of this goodness. And in fact, people who are wise, well, maybe they don't have a body count higher than everyone else's. Maybe they stay true to a spouse and they invest their wealth in their children and, in fact, in their children and their children's children. And they invest their what they have learned from the Spirit and they pass it down from generation to generation so that they not only will have their best life now, but they, in fact, will participate in a much longer spirit that is a family or a tribe or a people or a nation or a civilization. And all of that comes from something very low beneath. It's so built into everything. Well, Tom Holland as a young schoolboy is hearing these clergy drone on and on from the Apostle Paul and, and, and listening to these stories. And what do I care about slaves in Egypt? Egypt and Rome and and Carolina and London and China and New Mexico and the whole world was full of slaves. What on earth does one story about a group of slaves walking out because somehow there's a big story about some big god who rained down plagues and let them walk out only to make a mess of things in the desert, only to finally get into the promised land, only to make a mess of that too. Why should I care? Going with this idea that part of what the Bible is doing is describing a, a priority, a manner in which perceptions and actions might be prioritized and for a structure of priority. Perceptions and actions might be prioritized. Well, Sam Harris is certainly doing that. He's saying, oh, Andrew Tate should not have priority in terms of the attention of young men. Donald Trump should not have priority in terms of the attention of the nation. There's, there, there are other spirits. There are other things. There is, there is a structure to reality. There is a moral existence that should hold sway. And if it is not, I'm ready to put on my black t-shirt and lift again some more of those feudal black things to come on the air and use my words to promote that spirit. Even if I say, well, that doesn't have anything to do with that old book called the Bible. Well, Jordan clearly thinks it does. Priority is a, a priority, a manner in which perceptions and actions might be prioritized. And for a structure of priority is a pyramidal structure and something has to be at the top. And I learned from Carl Jung that whatever is at the top of your hierarchy of assumptions functions as God for you, whether... Oh, remember all the way back to Tom Holland and religion, religion, show up on the shores of India and say, oh, I see you're a religious people. What? What are you talking about? We, we understand karma. We go to temple. We sacrifice to our gods. No, no, that's religion. Oh, whatever's at the top of this structure, that like Sam Harris clearly has a structure in mind about good, bad, right, and wrong, because Andrew Tate shouldn't be the focus of people's attention. Donald Trump shouldn't be the focus of national attention. Others that have 
ideas and morals and values, even if they are not like Genghis Khan spreading their seed to millions and millions of descendants in an Andrew Tate sort of way, there is a value that means things like, well, Sam Harris very much recognizes, be devoted to one's wife and to one's daughters and be ethical with respect to one's money and one's body and do all of these things. Well, well, is that is that reasonable? Well, well, what is that reason for? Does that well, reason is clearly here to help me live my best life now, to help me enjoy my short trip from zero to 80 as best I can. And, well, you can listen to Bill Maher and Scott Adams and say, well, marriage is kind of stupid because I get more tail living like Andrew Tate than I do living like Sam, Sam Adams or Jordan Peterson. He's been married for 35 years and he's still in love with his wife. In fact, he says to Bill Maher, we can barely keep our hands off each other. And Bill Maher's thinking, yeah, boy, a whole lot of women are listening to this. Jordan, you could really step out and get a lot on the side. And Jordan's like, nope, it's not my game. Well, why not? Where does this other game come from? It's a very old game. It comes from some very old sources and... I think part of the reason Jordan is looking in all of these other areas rather than just telling young men what they should do, sort of what he focused on in 2016, 17, and 18, is he's saying there's wisdom about how we together ought to organize ourselves. And maybe now, after you've had a few years of sort of cleaning your room and getting back into shape, maybe now you should look for wisdom how to not only have leadership over your personal domains, but also participating in leadership over a civilization. Or not, you're... And I learned from Carl Jung that whatever is at the top of your hierarchy of assumptions functions as God for you, whether or not you're religious. And maybe you have multiple things at the top, which just means that you're confused. And then if Jung is correct, and I believe he is, then the question of what should be at the top really exists as the paramount question. And part of the way the biblical narrative represents that or addresses that is by describing God in some sense as a literary character, as Northrop Fry, a Canadian critic, pointed out. And one of the things that's remarkable about the Exodus text is that the highest ethical spirit to which we're beholden is presented precisely as that spirit that allies itself with the cause of freedom against tyranny. And that's put forward as a prime ethical dictum. So if it's the voice of God speaking to you, so to speak, then it's going to call you out of slavery, maybe the slavery of your own mind, the slavery of external conditions, the slavery of the tyranny. It's going to call you out of that slavery into freedom, even if that pulls you into the desert. And that's really something, that's really something to know. And I think something that's deeply true. All right, so having said that. Okay, why is he studying Exodus? Because the world is complex and you have to make choices. And it's one thing to be a slave. In fact, once you take the people out of Egypt, getting Egypt out of the people is gonna be a different thing eating leeks and onions by the Nile. Ooh, what breath, but dining out in style, Keith Green. These stories that have shaped a civilization, these stories that have held our attention, these stories that have worked on us at levels we don't really know. Is that I got in the well. Yes, that's right. It means that if you don't say what you have to say when you're called upon to say it, you'll put the whole damn ship at risk. Now, the soldiers figure this out, or the sailors, they figure out, oh, there must be someone on the boat that, like, isn't right with God, and that's why we're in danger of being swamped. So they will go and ask everybody, and Jonah, to his credit, says, yeah, it's me, you know, I, I had, the voice of conscience made itself manifest to me, I had a task to do, I refused it, I'm screwing things up. And the sailors actually try to save him. But now, the voice of conscience... Or maybe God was a lot more real to Jonah and a lot more clear and said, it's Nineveh, Jonah, go. But it doesn't work, so they throw him overboard. Now you think, okay, Jonah's got what he deserves because he shut the hell up when he had something to say. And now he's going to die. 
and you think that's pretty damn rough. And partly what that means is if you hold your tongue when you have something to say, then you're going to put the ship at risk and you'll be lucky if you don't die. All right, but that's not enough. That's not nearly enough because that isn't all that happens if you don't say what you're called upon to say. So the next thing that happens is Jonah's drowning away. That's about as bad as it gets. And then this creature from hell itself comes up from the bottom of the abyss and <laughs> takes him down. And so now he's in hell for three days. And so that's the next part of the story, which is that if you're called upon to say what you have to say and you refuse it, like you'll end up in a place where you wish Wait, you were not dead. the whale? I, I, I thought he wasn't talking to young men. What, what, what? Not the whale? Yeah, it's the whale. Oh, okay. It, because, but it's the same thing. Like, that in well, the story, the I, whale is described as hell. It's I remember exactly the same idea. In Religious, the guy who was arguing with me, and he said, uh, he was very, this point was very important to him. He said, the Bible does not say whale. It says big fish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, now it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, it's it's the thing. Well, what it is, it's a it's a representation of the thing that dwells but in the you, dark. It's so interesting that you see the lessons in these, and I just always read these things as like super fucking stupid from mm -hmm. the Bronze Age. Mm -hmm. You know. Hmm. Wonder where he got that idea. Obviously, they were telling people something. I mean, whoever wrote this was had a, a message in mind. Well, they were trying to fit. Look, they were trying to figure out by telling stories, how the state itself got corrupted. And this is... Now, it's very interesting what Bill Maher will immediately connect here. One of those stories. So the story is, here's how the state gets corrupted. You're called upon to tell your fellow man, enemy or not, when they're not behaving properly. When your conscience tells you to do that, you're called upon to do that. If you don't do that, the whole ship will start to rock. But do you think the ancients who were reading this at the time and they read the story about the, the he gets swallowed by the big fish yeah. or the whale. You think they got this message? They were like, yeah, but what this really means is when you're called upon, excuse me, I'm talking, when you're called upon, then you step up and do it. No, or no, I think, would say it's a step and it's a... It's a is, is that what happens with our movies? Is that what happens with, with all of these other stories? So when we see little girls on a landscape and suddenly look what's before them. Look what's before them. Well, well, do you, do you boil that down into a message? Well, sometimes you do. But in fact, in the image here, look at the size of the girls. And then look at the Barbie. And then... She smiles upon them, the goddess that she is. And suddenly, no, I don't want to raise little babies. Well, is, is this the message? Do people get the message? Does this communicate? Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it communicates. If it didn't communicate, the powerful of the world wouldn't spend billions of dollars doing these things. Sam Harris thinks it's all got to be very straightforward and rational. Really? Tell me how this plays in you. Is it rational? Don't you say, no, that's, a, that's like an actress. And... And she's, they're taking her picture and she's just, she's just showing these white things that we use to chew our food. And, and, and she's lowering something so that we can see these organs that she uses to see with. Is, is that what's happening in this picture? Really? Is that what's happening in this picture? Why? is on one hand, this little four-year-old. Why the glasses? That's surely accidental. It's an accident of the actor. Surely the person carefully crafting the story and the images didn't want to take this beautiful little child and at least pose a sense of adult 
looking with clarity on the idol before them. Is this sort of like maybe a story in the Bible of Nebuchadnezzar standing up an image and all of the nation around must bow before it? Why read the book of Exodus? Why get together with some knowledgeable friends and compare notes? And, and some of what they'll do is exactly what Bill Maher just saw Jordan Peterson do and say, oh, okay, so here's the story of Jonah. That story works on us on all of these levels. Is the story of Jonah exhausted by Jordan Peterson's telling of it? No. Well, why not? How would you know? Because preachers and rabbis and, and, and religious people and non-religious people have been reading this story and it communicates again and again and again and again. And these stories underneath played like depth charges beneath our civilization and broke up the Roman Empire. And in fact, it was happening before. What, why were there all these synagogues around the empire? And well, well, the Jews went out. And why were there all these God-fearers, these, these other people that looked at the Jews and said, well, you're awfully strange. Why don't you bow before the image? No, we don't bow before images. Well, why not? Well, because we believe that you shall not make a graven image and say, that's my God. Well, what's the God? It's that which is at the top of your hierarchy. It's so back to the terrible communities and a little back and forth on Twitter with um, one of the Richards. And he said, well, I like Augustine's definition of community. It's it's the people that gather around that which they most love. I mean, all of these little girls love a uh, beautiful uh, adult woman? Are they? No, that's, that's not the way, let's say, Andrew Tate might be taken with the vision of this beautiful adult woman. They're looking at her as an ideal. They're looking at her as perhaps something to worship. They're looking at her and saying, oh, maybe I don't want to be like mommy caring for the little baby, my little baby sister. Maybe I'd like to be like Barbie, standing astride the world with the elements of power. Maybe I could be a vision that looks like this at least for as long as youth and the technology that we have to try to fix beauty upon us, whether it's black, tight t-shirts with swole arms, or maybe the skin, the hair, the glasses, just the right amount of coverage in a black and white zebra thing, the form of the legs, and of course, the heels. Exodus, what is this about? Well, it's about everything. How should we live? Well, let's go back and look at how our ancestors thought we should live. Maybe there's something in those stories. Maybe those stories communicate in a way that is, hmm, has something to say about this figure in the universe. So how far will we get? Well, I'll have to be a little bit, I'll have to have some of the discipline of Jordan Peterson if we're going to make our way through these series because we just scratched the introduction. So leave a comment.